everyone here tonight. We're excited to have Evan. Evan, I should have asked. Wiener. Wiener. Okay. Okay. Evan Wiener here tonight to talk about all things baseball. Um, he, he shared with me some little exciting news that he's going to tell you about as well during this presentation. Um, but I just, before we start, I wanted to let everyone know that we are recording this program. There have been a few number of um, patrons who have expressed interest but weren't able to join. So we're hoping that they'll be able to catch it at their own convenience at a later time. Um, none of the participants will be viewed. It'll solely be Evan's screen. So you don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. um, nothing you say or put in the chat, nothing, nothing like that will be shared. Although if they um, want, if they have something to say, they can unmute themselves or they could put it in chat because uh, it's baseball and people do have some opinions, even though I'm not talking about any teams here, I'm just gonna be telling stories. So, but yes, if you yes. have anything to put in chat, for instance, this morning I did this talk uh, out on Long Island in Elmont, and uh, there was one guy who uh, who got something right, actually, and I brought it up, and I said, you were right in the talk, and you might catch it yourself here in the middle of the talk, but I'm all ready to go, so. Okay. Okay, well, I want to thank the uh, library for inviting me. My name is Evan Weiner. I have been doing this type of thing since 1971. Uh, I was 15 years old, you could do the math, and last Friday uh, I became officially part of the Medicare club last Friday, so I'm waiting for Joe Namath to come bang on my door and try to sell me some uh, Medicaid uh, supplement insurance. Uh, but in 1971, uh, I was in 11th grade, I had a, a teacher in English uh, named Joe Dionisio, I still talk to him half century later. He opened up a lot of doors for me, he put me on uh, the high school uh, radio talk show, which was on uh, WRKL radio commercially, opened the door for me at the Nyack Journal News, opened the door for me at the Bergen Record. I had three separate uh, uh, stints over at the Bergen Record uh, while I was in high school, right after college, and I was writing op-ed pieces for the Bergen Record about 15 years ago before uh, they decided to pull the money in on the editorial side. Uh, the guy over here who you see uh, is uh, Lawrence Peter Yogi Berra. Uh, the proprietor of a museum. Actually, he wasn't the proprietor. Floyd Hall was, and uh, the New York Yankees ownership was of the Yogi Berra Learning Center and Museum. And I spoke there uh, quite a few times, and every time I would speak there, Yogi would do the same thing. He'd come up to me, pat me on the back, say, good job, kid, good job, kid, you want anything to eat? Yogi Berra, was at the center of American culture in the 1950s. Uh, you saw him on What's My Line. You saw him on the Bilko Show. You saw him every year except 1954 and 1959 playing in the World Series. And the Yankees happened to win almost every one of those World Series that he was in during the 1950s, the exception when Johnny Padres uh, in game seven beat the Yankees in 1955. So Yogi, the Yankees, the golden age of baseball, baseball in the culture, and there was a French philosopher by the name of Jacques Barzat. And uh, in 1954, he was writing a series of essays, and one of the essays he wrote about was baseball. And he said, whoever wants to know the heart and mind of, baseball, of America had better learn baseball. And, and don't necessarily go to a major league game. No, 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 go watch a Sandlot game. Go watch a high school game. Go watch a semi-pro game. Go watch a minor league game where you could really zoom in on how baseball operates. Because baseball in the mid 1950s, well, it was baseball, it was boxing, it was horse racing, and two television came along. And that kind of flipped everything around. Uh, in fourth grade, 1964, 1965, I went to PS 151 in Woodside, Queens. Had a teacher by the name of Miss Alexander, who we all thought was about 117 years old. Uh, she was in her 60s. Um, she was wearing the requisite white blouse with the blue skirt. She had the blue hair and she had the uh, tissue stuffed up here in case. Uh, up here in case um, she needed to blow her nose or something. And uh, this had to be March, April of 1965, and I'm eight going on nine. And she gives us an assignment. And the assignment is pretty simple. Analyze this poem, Casey at the Bat. And um, okay, I read it. It's about baseball. That's good because I was a kid who loved baseball at that time. So that's good. So I'm reading the poem, reading the poem. And yeah, this guy strikes out with the bases loaded in the bottom of the ninth inning. 
So big deal. He's a lousy baseball player. Oh, no, no, no. You don't understand that this, po this poem is about, it's about man. It's about man's failure. Uh, and man could be set up to do. She's giving me this morality lesson. And I'm thinking, she struck out. The guy struck out. I had a chance to win the game. He struck out. There's no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey struck out. He was a lousy baseball player. Well, um, it was written by a guy by the name of Ernest Thayer. And Thayer and I have one thing in common. We both wrote columns at one time for the San Francisco Examiner. Him between 1886 and 1888 and me in 2001, I, I wrote a few columns for them. Uh, Ernest Thayer did not take any credit uh, for Casey at the Bat. It was printed on June 3rd, 1888. And um, Nobody seems to know why he didn't take any credit, but he didn't take any credit. Maybe he just thought it was a throwaway piece that um, when you're a writer, when you're a broadcaster, uh, you can't be good every time out. You're going to have some clunkers. Maybe he thought it was a clunker. Uh, who was Casey? Might have been King Kong Kelly, who played uh, over uh, in New England uh, when Thayer was going to school at Harvard. Could have been somebody in Stockton, California. Uh, the minor league team in Stockton is called the uh, Mudville Nine, so it may, maybe somebody there, but nobody seems to know, and Thayer never talked about it. In fact, Thayer took no credit for the poem until a Harvard class reunion in 1895, but by that time, by 1895, the poem was a big deal. It was ingrained in the American culture thanks to this guy, Russell Hunting. Russell Hunting. Uh, he was, uh, rather, this is not Russell Hunting, this is DeWolf Hopper. Russell Hunting comes up. DeWolf Hopper. And DeWolf Hopper uh, was the father of Heather Hopper. Heather Hopper was the gossip columnist in the 1950s and 60s. Prior to that, she was an actress. Anyway, he gets a hold of the San Francisco uh, Examiner, and he takes a look at uh, this poem on the op-ed piece about baseball, and he says, hmm, this, well, this is good. This is good. I think Hopper was an actor. I think I could do something with it. And by the middle of August, he does. Uh, he was a vaudeville star, and this become, became a vaudeville act, the Wolf Hopper. And he performs it for the first time on August 14th, 1888. It's estimated that Hopper performed the poem more than 10,000 times. And that is the Springfield Library up the road from you a little bit. And some of you might know in the Springfield Library, there is a little room um, where uh, there's stuff like uh, that cylinder that plays, actually works. Debbie up there, the, uh, the one, the director of the library, actually played it for me. And there was some sort of Sousa song on that. Uh, apparently there was a, a hermit that lived in town, had no heirs, died, and he had all this stuff. They didn't know what to do with it. Springfield Library did have a room uh, their conference room, and they set this thing up and uh, the case behind me with a bunch of other stuff. And uh, if you wanted to, in the 1890s, and you were into Casey at the Bat, you wanted to hear a voice actor perform it, I have the guy for you. His name is Russell Hunting, and he was an actor, an entertainer, and he played around with sound, and he records this thing twice, once in 1893, and again in 1898, both times using a heavy Irish brogue because he thought that Casey was Irish. Uh, down at uh, Menlo Park, which is not too far from you where Edison's headquarters were and are, uh, John Kaiser records it for Thomas Edison. That's in 1905. Hopper's version is recorded for Victor before it became RCA Victor and his master's voice with Nipper the dog. That doesn't come out until 1906. Um, that is me in Sagway, Quebec. Uh, I speak on cruise ships, although I don't know when I'm going back on a cruise ship. No hurry. And uh, there was this guy in Sagway. He had this garage open and part of his house open and people are milling about looking what's inside. And he has all kinds of stuff inside, including that, a Victroller, one of those crank jobs that you cranked it up, put the record on there and you could play. You could play Kaiser. You could play Hopper. If you have one of those in your home in the uh, 19, uh, uh, and, uh, the 19 teens, you could listen to that at home. Remember, there's no radio, and there's a picture of Edison behind uh, the Victrola. Hopper would be the first to commit the verse to film, a short subject made by a director by the name of Lee DeForest in 1922. 
Barry starred in a 1927 film version of it. Uh, some of you might remember Bob Hope, and some of you might remember his sidekick, Jerry Colonna, the guy with a big mustache. Or one of his catchphrases was, where's Yehuda? Anyway, he recorded a rendition for Disney, which would provide the basis for a 1946 Disney cartoon, Casey at the Bat. Jackie Gleason performed it on his television show in the 1950s. Johnny Bench, Tug McGraw, George Steinbrenner, and Billy Martin together, and others voiced the poem. George and Billy did it down in Tampa for the uh, Tampa PBA, uh, uh, Police uh, uh, Patrolman Benevolent Society PBA. And um, they were getting along in those days. Um, I don't know how long, maybe Billy was fired by the end of the night, but uh, George and Billy did it. And it was done in orchestral settings like George and Billy did. Now, if you look at that sign, take a close look at that sign, ball game today at the Polo Grounds. Does that sign mean anything to you? It was on the New York City subway uh, system, um, and uh, it was next to probably the predecessor of Dr. Zinsmore, who killed Zitz. Uh, but uh, there was a songwriter. The songwriter is named Jack Norwood. And Jack Norwood is looking at that, looking at that, looking at that, and he get something in his, his mind. He's going to write a song about baseball. He's on the uh, subway. And he goes and he sees his uh, friend, um, collaborator, Albert Von Tilzer, and says, I got an idea for a song. Uh, it's going to be about baseball. And he explains what it's about. And that song that was released in 1908 is still being played today. And that's Harry Carey, who I worked with in 1994. And uh, Harry at Wrigley Field, uh, in between the top of the seventh and the bottom of the seventh inning, singing as badly as Harry Carey could sing, Take Me Out to the Ball Game, uh, which you don't see there. And I work with Harry, so I knew some of his friends named Bud quite intimately because I used to see him around them. Uh, six of his friends named Bud, last name Wiser. Anyway. He would uh, sing the song, and the Wrigley Field faithful would stand up and sing along with him. He passes away, uh, but the tradition of Harry Carey lives on in Wrigley Field uh, in between the top of the seventh and the bottom of the seventh inning. Somebody, a celebrity, usually sings, take me out to the ball game. But there's one catch. You have to sing it poorly. You cannot sing it well. You can't be like Bob Merrill, my old buddy who once told me, he said, you know what the difference between me and Sinatra was? I said, about a billion dollars. He said, no, besides that. He said, I knew when to get off the stage. Bob Merrill doesn't have his number retired by the New York Yankees, but nobody's ever won, wore it because his number was half, <coughs> one slash two. And Billy had it, Billy Martin had it in his locker. He said, here, throw this on when you do the national anthem. And he did with the number half on the back. Anyway, so. Von Tilzer and Norwood put together the song. And uh, Norwood's former girlfriend uh, was a bit of a suffragette, a woman's liber. Um, first of all, no woman, no respectable woman uh, in the 1900s would be seen at a baseball game. It just wasn't a place for women back then. Uh, players were ruffians, they were thugs, they were varmints, all these bad people and a proper woman would never be seen in that kind of society, even watching a game. However, however, um, apparently she was a modern day woman in 1906. He breaks up with her, but some of that remains in his mind and he's writing the lyrics Von Tilzer puts together the song. Now the song is about Katie Casey. Don't know much about Katie Casey. We assume she's young. She might be from Manhattan. She might be from Brooklyn. Uh, she has, it looks like a boyfriend, but maybe not a boyfriend, maybe a husband, a brother, a father, I don't know. But let's say it's a boyfriend. And they're going back and forth trying to figure out, well, what should we do on the date? And uh, she's not interested in what he's doing. And uh, she's not, and he's not interested in what she wants. And she breaks out. You know what you should do for me? Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and Cracker Jacks. I don't care if I ever get back, for we will root, root, root for the home team. They don't win. It's a shame. For it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. We don't know if they ever went to the ball game. 
the next stanza is about Katie and uh, how Katie has the baseball bug and she loves baseball and she knows all the players. I don't know how she knows all the players, but she does. Um, they have no numbers on their back. They have no names on their back. And she's, she isn't afraid to scream at an umpire that makes a bad call. Uh, and she knows how to get the players aroused. And then they go back into the take me out to the ball game part. Uh, baseball does not embrace that until 1934. Uh, the song written 1908. Uh, the songwriters, Jack Norworth and Albert Von Tilzer, never saw a baseball game when they wrote the song. The song would become famous on the vaudeville stage thanks to Nora Bays, who became Norworth's wife after he broke up with the other woman, and she popularized it um, in vaudeville, uh, along with the other song, Shine on Harvest Moon. Shine on, shine on, Harvest Moon. Um, of the two songs, 113 years later, uh, Shine on, Harvest Moon must be played somewhere, but every season, every year between February and November, Take Me Out to the Ball Game is played across the United States, in Canada, and in other countries. As far as uh, Norwith and Von Tilzer, who are in the Songwriters Hall of Fame, Norwith didn't see a baseball game until 1928. Von Tilzer would see a baseball game 32 years after he wrote the song in 1940. Uh, the song was not braced by baseball until 1934, the World Series between St. Louis and Detroit. It was played uh, at that point. It must have been uh, Briggs Stadium in Detroit. Now, Take Me Out to the Ball Game had quite the life outside of the baseball. Yeah, didn't have the life inside the baseball, but outside of the baseball, it, it was around. The song was around and around and around, particularly at Night at the Opera. And there is Groucho. Uh, complete with uh, Peanuts and Cracker Jacks. Um, the story is pretty simple, and you might have the movie at the library, Night at the Opera. Um, Margaret Dumont is patronized. She's, she's the one who's putting up money for the opera. And she finds out that there's a great tenor in Italy. And the company goes from New York to Italy to find this great tenor. Of course, Groucho gets sidetracked because he beats Chico and Harpo, who happen to be friends with another tenor, who they tell Groucho is the greatest tenor in the world. And Groucho thinks he's the greatest tenor in the world. You might remember the movie, they come over, there's stowaways. It's the steam room scene where everybody crowds in and falls out and all that other stuff. But they finally get to the opera. And, um, well, the guy who Margaret Dumont wants obviously came over, and they got to knock him out, get rid of him, which they do. And then they need to kill time to dress up Harpo and Chico's friend, and so he could perform. Uh, and there's a love story here with Kitty Carlisle. She's the one who's uh, on stage, and she's the singer and all that other stuff, but that's immaterial. What happens is um, they have to kill some time, Chico and Harpo. And so they go around, they get sheet music, they go down to the orchestra pit, they give all the uh, players um, the sheet music, take me out to the ball game. They take out a glove and ball, and they're throwing at each other. J uh, Groucho drops down uh, to where the people are and starts selling them peanuts and Cracker Jacks. Uh, and uh, that's not the only time that uh, take me out to the ball game was on film. Harpo Marx would return to the song in I Love Lucy, an I Love Lucy episode 1955. It is featured in numerous movies and in TV shows uh, and has had a life of its own for the last 113 years. That is Patterson, New Jersey's Lou Costello talking to Bud Abbott. Um, I guess you kind of know that baseball was not invented in 1839 in Cooperstown, New York. Um, Abner Doubleday was never in Cooperstown, New York, as far as military records show. He was at West Point and stayed in the Army. Uh, but the Mills Commission, uh, around the turn of the uh, 19th into the 20th century, wanted to show that baseball was an American game and that it was invented in the United States. And it was invented in Cooperstown by Abner Doubleday. That was a myth. But they went looking for somebody who they thought would say that he was in Cooperstown when Abner Doubleday invented baseball. And they found the guy. His name, Abner Graves. He's kind of a drunk. Uh, he's an older guy. They find him in Denver at uh, the turn of the 20th century. 
And uh, they started interviewing him and said, yeah, I, I saw Abner Doubleday. I was five years old. I saw Abner Doubleday. He's out there and he's laying out the lines and, and he's got all, and that's, I know he invented baseball and the Mills Commission bought the uh, story hook, line and sinker. But um, if I speak up at the Berkshire or in the Berkshires in uh, July and August, my wife's cousin has a place up there. So I'll go up there and give a number of talks while I'm there. And, uh, there's uh, in North Adams, Massachusetts, there's an old uh, mill factory that's been turned into an uh, art museum. And across the street from the art museum is the uh, Berkshires Baseball Museum. And it honors Jack Chesborough, who won 41 games with the New York Highlanders in 1904, the predecessor of the uh, New York Yankees, and Jeff Reardon, who pitched with the Mets and the Expos and probably a couple other teams, a relief pitcher in the 70s and 80s. And uh, there is in the window, I didn't go into the place because it was closing. We got done at the museum and walked across the street. So I didn't get to go in. But uh, there was a little article um, in the window talking about uh, from some newspapers, you know, printed, 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 printed. So it's a photocopy of whatever was out there. And it talked about uh, baseball, B-A-S-E capital B-A-L-L, -L, being played in Pittsfield in that environment uh, environment uh, in 1792, which uh, means that baseball evolved from a game called rounders, which is a similar game to baseball played in England. Um, this style of comedy is called rounders, and it was a very popular style of comedy uh, in vaudeville, 19-teens, 1920s, into the 1930s, along with burlesque. And um, it's pretty simple. Rounders is pretty simple, actually, when you think of it as a, uh, as a form of comedy. You have the idiot, Costello, the pinhead. Um, that's his role. And you have the wise guy, Abbott. Abbott with the St. Louis Wolves. And very quickly, I'll show you how this works. Um, thanks to John Joseph, a comedian friend of mine, mentored by Alan King, you might remember him, and Max Docelli, another uh, uh, comedy friend of mine, who uh, comic friend of mine, uh, who grew up in Newark, actually. Had a pizza place once in the Newark area. But anyway, um, the idiot, Costello, meets Abbott, and he sees he's part of the St. Louis Wolves baseball team. And the idiot says, oh, I'm a big fan. You know, I love your team, all that other stuff. Can you tell me what the lineup is? And, and Abbott says, well, we got who's on first. Well, what do you mean who's on first? What's the guy's name? His name is who? And it goes round and round and round. And they could do it for a minute. They could do it for 10 minutes. You know, Costello would ask him, when um, who gets paid, uh, does he see the money? Who gets paid to see the money? He says, every penny of it. So it goes round and round and round and round. And that evolves from, or that is an old time uh, comic routine called Rounders, uh, done by a game that came out of Rounders. So it was a common vaudeville act style in the day. Uh, did Abbott and Costello pay Michael Musto $15 for the routine? Because Musto had the routine and said to have been the father of the routine. Uh, John Joseph said, of course he did. Max Docelli said, of course he didn't. We're comics. We steal everything. So it's unknown. In fact, it's even unknown whether or not Musto himself came up with the routine because there are a whole bunch of people who claim that they came up with the routine because it was a common routine. Uh, Abbott might have done the routine, a version of the routine when he started out on the burlesque circuit. He used to be the guy who collected the money. He got on stage one day and he became a straight man and he meets Costello on the burlesque circuit about 1934, 1935. They get a hold of this around 1939 and they're work, working their way up, working their way up, working their way up, and they become some something of a regular on the Kate Smith radio show uh, by 1938. And Kate Smith was one of the top-rated radio shows back in 1938. Uh, they premiered their routine on the Kate Smith radio show on CBS. You might have gotten some help from uh, Costello's writer, John Grant, or a veteran comedy writer by the name of Will Glickman, who actually wrote Car 54, Where Are You? episodes for Nat Hyken uh, in the early 1960s. Hyken will come back into this talk a little later. Anyway, Evan Costello, uh, now you know the rest of the story. They premiered it. They killed. It's a smash. They become superstars. And they go on to perform this at the White House for Roosevelt, for Harry Truman, 
for Dwight Eisenhower. They perform it in the movies. They're on radio with it. They're on TV with it. They're all over the place with it. And by 1956, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello are enshrined into Baseball's Hall of Fame. Uh, they are the first outsiders outside the industry uh, ever to be enshrined into the Hall of Fame. Now, you got some writers in there, but the writers uh, were connected to baseball. And uh, about 15 years ago, Vin Scully, the uh, longtime Dodger announcer who came to the Dodgers in 1950 from Fordham University, is looking up at his screen as he's doing uh, the uh, simulcast uh, on both radio and TV. So he looks at his screen and he sees somebody on first base. It's who? The Dodgers had a South Korean player by the name of who? And Scully looks at his monitor and he says, uh, now we know the answer to the eternal baseball question of who's on first. There is who on first. And who is on first? And there was a what on second. What played second base for Washington in the 1920s uh, before the routine became really famous. But I could guarantee this. I could guarantee this. Nowhere in organized ball, from Little League Sandlot up to Major League Baseball, will you ever find a third baseman called, I don't give a darn. You're just not going to find it. Uh, about three and a half years ago, I went up to Hyde Park, wanted to talk to Franklin Roosevelt, had some questions for him. I do other talks. I do a talk on the 1936 Olympics. I worked with Marty Glickman at the NBC Broadcasting School in the 1980s when he was working with broadcasters. And I was one of, I wasn't quite an instructor, but I was one of the assistants who helped out in terms of being a color commentator for somebody who was uh, trying to work a game. One case it was Leandra Riley who wanted to become one of the first women uh, to be uh, an NFL broadcaster on NBC. Uh, Franklin, my wife and I are there. Franklin and Eleanor, great guests, gracious, gracious, gracious guests. A little stiff, but yeah, I mean, okay, they're a little aged, but they're a little stiff. Uh, and they got some books there. The books are kind of stiff, but you know, hey, they were very, very nice. And I had some basic questions. I want to know why Roosevelt sent the Olympic team to perform in Berlin, the Hitler Games, and legitimize the Hitler regime in 1936. I got my answer actually through Marty. He said, I wanted to go there. Marty was 18 years old, the fastest kid in Brooklyn. He wanted to be on the 4x100 relay team, which he wasn't, but he wanted to win the gold medal to stick it into uh, the Fuhrer's faces. He said, I wanted to see the Fuhrer see a Jew win a gold medal. Uh, Roosevelt thought it'd be good for the athletes. Roosevelt uh, was the first guy on TV, 1939 in the United States, April 30th of 1939 at the New York World's Fair, greeting people to the World's Fair. And in 1941, uh, Pearl Harbor is bombed. bombed. And um, Roosevelt uh, is asked by the baseball commissioner, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, should we play or should we not play? Uh, 1918, baseball cut the season down somewhat. Um, they locked off September, not because of the Spanish flu. That would come later that year, but it was because of the war. And um, the American League voted to end the season. National League didn't. They would have a World Series. And Babe Ruth, the best baseball player ever, great pitcher, great home run hitter, high average hitter, Babe Ruth would lead the Boston Red Sox to the World Championship. Uh, but he would do it with his left arm, not his bat. He was a great, great pitcher. Um, so Landis is asking, what should we do? And Roosevelt sends him what is now known as the green light letter. I honestly feel that would be best for the country to keep baseball going. Baseball provides a recreation, which does not last over two hours or two and a half hours. Obviously, Roosevelt never saw a Red Sox Yankee game for four and a half hours. But then again, he died in 1945 and which incidentally can be got for very little cost. Uh, well, maybe 80 bucks for bleacher seats, opening day in Yankee Stadium is a little excessive, but you know what? Roosevelt could afford it, his, his class could afford that. And incidentally, I hope that night games can be extended because it gives an opportunity to the day shift to see a game occasionally. Roosevelt thought baseball was so interwoven into the American culture that not even a world war could stop it that people were interested in it. George Han Herman, George Herman Babe Ruth. He was in 10 movies between 1920 and around 1940. Um, his first movie was a silent movie. 
Henning Holm, star of base, Davis, what else? A baseball star. His last movie was uh, Pride of the Yankees, the Lou Gehrig story. Uh, in 1927, Babe is in a movie called Babe Comes Home, typecasting him as a baseball player. A silent movie, no print to survive, partially because the prints in those days, uh, just unless you really took care of it, they disintegrated because nobody thought, you know, 100 years later, anybody would want to see a film from, say, 1927. Uh, he was in Harold Lloyd's silent movie in 1928, Speedy, which has been preserved. Speedy has been preserved. He played himself in a cameo role. He's signing autograph for kids. He sees a cab because he's got to get to Yankee Stadium for a game. Harold Lloyd is driving it, and it's a cab ride that Babe is not going to forget anytime soon. So he was in 10 movies overall. The first baseball star that went over to the silver screen and Broadway and the vaudeville stage and burlesque was Mike Donlin, who played with the New York Giants. Uh, the baseball idol of Manhattan, he was a career 333 hitter. Took multiple breaks from the game to perform on stage and in vaudeville. He retired for good. In 1914, goes right into the movies and he's typecast right away because the movie's called Right Off the Bat which featured another actor who happened to manage the New York Giants, John McGraw. John was in a number of movies as well. Uh, in fact, if you go to Fort Lee, to the Fort Lee Library, and the, the parking lot at Fort Lee Library, there were all kinds of signs, because apparently the film industry at one time was right on that, uh, where the parking lot is for the Fort Lee Library. And uh, apparently there, that's where movies were made back in the 19-teens. And you see the little signs there and all that stuff. Uh, people think, researchers think that Donlin was in 53 uh, films. It's not Gary Cooper. That's Lou Gehrig. And that's Lou Gehrig at Grand Central Terminal in New York. And he's, he's, he's uh, saying goodbye to baseball. Fond farewell to baseball. It's 1938. He's had it with baseball. Um, you know what? Can't take the rat race anymore. Can't take the pressure of being Lou Gehrig on the baseball field. And he's bought himself a ranch in Montana. And he's going to go with his sister. Not his wife, Ellie, but with his sister. And he's going to leave baseball behind. And he is going to relax in solitude for the rest of his life. Well, it's kind of interesting. Um, because uh, Gehrig um, was a New York City kid, went to high school in New York City, went to college, Columbia University, played for the New York Yankees. He lived in New Rochelle, uh, the streets now known as Lou Gehrig's Lou Gehrig Way, which I pass every once in a while, um, going to through New Rochelle to say Glen Island. Um, anyway, so yeah, he's had it. That's it. Movie's awful. Movie is awful. There's no redeeming value to this movie, but. For medical research, it's a big deal. He shoots at 1938. He's diagnosed with the ALS in 1939. And it's kind of a gold mine of, of sorts for medical researchers because they could see the way Gary, not only from this film, but also from the occasional uh, movie tone from Fox, uh, those reels that you saw or they saw back in the uh, 30s uh, at the theater. Uh, they, but with this film, they're able to see how Lou Gehrig walked in 1938, how he swung his arms, how he moved his neck, facial expressions and all that. And they were able to measure how quickly uh, the AL ALS uh, advanced in his body. Um, they get him in 1939, but they have a year and a half of a sample uh, from that movie to see just how quickly uh, Lou Gehrig uh, developed this disease. So Gehrig's in this movie, and he announces his retirement. Um, rather interesting that Gehrig um, had some had an issue that allowed medical research, as did Babe Ruth. He had throat cancer, and Babe Ruth in 1947 was one of the first people ever to get chemotherapy, and they experimented with chemo with Babe Ruth, who had the throat cancer. Bugs Bunny. I learned everything in life from Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny's a heckler. He's out in uh, right field and he's got his carrot juice. So he's getting limbered up a little bit. He's got his carrot. He's got his uh, popcorn and he starts heckling. Hey, I'll murder the bums. I could beat you with one arm tied behind my back. Bugs is watching uh, the teetotalers uh, play the gas house gorillas. And uh, so they would take off on the St. Louis uh, Cardinals gas house gang baseball team in 1934. 
and uh, they take him up on the challenge and Bugs plays uh, all nine positions and uh, beats the Gas House Gorillas at the height of his 1940s popularity. Movies, uh, there is Madonna jumping into the arms of Rosie O'Donnell and Gina Davis back there with the chest protector in League of Their Own. Uh, Tom Hanks is in the movie. He's uh, the manager of uh, the Rockford Peaches. That was a real team, the Rockford Peaches, because this was a real league uh, back between 1943 and 1952. There was one team in that league called the Milwaukee Chicks. I don't think, I really don't think that you can name a uh, women's uh, athletic team these days, the Chicks. I don't think it would be politically correct. But anyway, um, and Tom Hanks is playing a character based on Jimmy Fox, the slugger who's managing in this league. And Tom Hanks uh, famously says in this movie, there's no crying in baseball. Uh, there is Gary Cooper playing Lou Gehrig, the pride of the Yankees. Um, it's it said that uh, Cooper's presentation of today, I mean, I'm the luckiest man on the face of the earth speech that Gehrig gave in 1939 is the reason people for decades uh, remembered that speech that Gehrig gave, I'm the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Uh, right now, unless you're a real baseball fan, you have no idea about that speech or even Lou Gehrig, except for the disease. Uh, Kevin Costner on the right, Tim Robbins on the left, that is Bull Durham. Uh, also starred Susan Saradin, who, uh, well, for lack of anything else, we'll just say Susan was friends to both of them because we might have kids watching this. Uh, Costner is a veteran old catcher, Crash Davis. Uh, who's on this team, basically, and hanging on in his career to catch guys with million-dollar arms and 10 cents heads like uh, Tim Robbins' character. Uh, Robbins' character was actually based on a real person, Steve Dalkowski, uh, Ron Shelton, who, run, who wrote this movie, produced and directed the movie, or directed the movie, uh, was a minor league baseball player in the 1960s in the Baltimore Orioles organization. And uh, his teammate was Dalkowski, who is a short left-handed pitcher who could throw a ball through a wall over 100 miles an hour, uh, but uh, had control problems and also had control problems off the field. Never made it to the major leagues and uh, the Tim Robbins character based on him. Uh, when the Dodgers, when Walter O'Malley took his Dodgers from Brooklyn to Los Angeles, the Dodger players were embraced by Hollywood. Here, Jerry Lewis is talking to Pee Wee Reese about something that he wants done in the movie uh, The Geisha Boy around 1958-59. Behind them is Don Zimmer, who is an original New York Met, among other things, a baseball lifer. Uh, Robert uh, Redford in The Natural. You might have the book or the movie in the library. Uh, here's Costner again talking to Joe Jackson, Field of Dreams in the Iowa cornfield. And uh, the smartest guy in the world, Billy Bean, played by Brad Pitt, the uh, Oakland A's general manager who was a New York Mets first round draft pick in 1980. Uh, Moneyball, which you probably have uh, both the book and the DVD in the library uh, about uh, analytics and how Billy Bean used analytics to have some success running the Oakland A's baseball team. Walter Matthau, Walter Matthau and Jack Lemmon, my, one of my favorite comedy teams, whether it's a fortune cookie, odd couple, grumpy old men, they play in the same role all the time. Uh, in this one, Matthau is here alone, and uh, he's the coach of the Bad News Bears, sponsored by Chico Bail Bonds. Uh, Major League, two movies about that, uh, Charlie Sheen and both of those. And oh, that's me in Pittsburgh in October of uh, 2018, and I'm leaning against the wall. Uh, the only thing that remains from Forbes Field in Pittsburgh, right in the middle of the University of Pittsburgh. And um, if you go to my right in the picture, your left a little while, uh, you will see the spot where Bill Mazeroski hit the home run uh, to win the 1960 uh, World Series for the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates. And you watch Yogi looking uh, that way, uh, running to the wall, watching the ball go over the wall. Um, the wall is still there. The, obviously, the stadium is long gone. But uh, I have this picture here because uh, Bing Crosby bought into the ownership of the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates back in 1946, the same year that Bob Hope bought into the uh, ownership of the Cleveland Indians. Uh, he stayed longer with his team than Crosby did. Hope 
uh, grew up in Cleveland, and um, he was born in England, but grew up in Cleveland. Um, Crosby, the only reason I mentioned that is he suggested that a film that was being shot called Angels in the Outfield should be shot at what was then still beautiful uh, Forbes Field, which was decrepit by the end of its tenure in 1970. These are not all the movies. These aren't all the movies at all, just some of them. Pride of the Yankees, Bull Durham, Major League, Angels in the Outfield, Fields of Dreams, Field of Dreams rather, Geisha Boy, Bad News Bears, The Natural, uh, and Moneyball. You know, just uh, a smattering of uh, the many movies that were made about baseball. Uh, that is a rather famous picture. It's actually a Pulitzer Prize winning picture. And it was taken by a guy by the name of Nat Fine. Uh, when I was 23 years old, I was working on a radio station called WGRC Radio in Rockland County at Nanuet, New York, 1300 on the dial. That's a long gone. Um, and uh, I ran into this guy by the name of Nat Fine. Nat Fine was taking uh, pictures for Orange and Rockland Utilities at the time and also had a little store in uh, Piermont, uh, in the beautiful little uh, village of Piermont on the Hudson River next to Grandview on the Hudson. And uh, I know a little about scoops because when I ran into Nat in 1978, I got my first scoop underneath my belt when I got John Lindsay. Well, I didn't get him. He told me that he was running for Senate for the state of New York in 1980. And that's how I ended up on WNEW Radio. Henry Marcotte called me, said, we want you to do that for us. I said, sure, how much are you gonna pay? 10 bucks, sold. And I did uh, three and a half years worth of work on WNEW, including interviewing Ronald Reagan. And uh, I was up at uh, Stewart Air Force Base in January of 1981 when the hostages returned from Iran. So I knew a little bit about scoops and uh, I talked to Nat Fine and I said, how did you end up getting this picture which won the Pulitzer Prize? Nat was with the New York Journal American at the time. How'd you get the picture? And uh, he told me, he said that uh, the Yankees clubhouse was on the third base side. The Yankees dugout was on the third base side. And all the photographers are milling around Bay because this is probably the last time you're ever going to see him in uniform. And they took pictures of a very sickly babe leaning on whatever he can lean on to stand up, putting on the uniform and then drudging out to the field uh, for the one last curtain call at Yankee Stadium. And he's on the third base line. Nat doesn't go out there that quickly. The others are out there. They take their positions, as you can see on the first base line. Nat rather slowly follows Babe. And Babe goes up the steps. Nat stops on the steps. And there is Babe, standing for the national anthem, leaning on his bat. And there it is, the picture that won the Pulitzer Prize. And I said to Nat, right place, right time? Because I was right place, right time. He said, yeah, right place, right time. Unfortunately, uh, Nat's career came to an end in 1965 with newspapers. Um, the uh, New York World, New York Journal American, and New York Herald Tribune uh, merged for the uh, World Journal Tribune. And uh, Nat was out of a job, and he ended up working for Orange and Rockland Utilities, uh, which is quite a come down from taking pictures of Dwight Eisenhower. Homer Simpson, baseball Hall of Famer or not, I'll ask you a bit later. But anyway, the Simpsons, TV, the Simpsons, um, Homer scores the winning runs. The uh, Springfield Nuclear Power Plant wins the championship, the city championship, uh, and they beat a whole bunch of uh, major league players, and there is Smithers with the trophy, and uh, uh, Monty Burns, the owner of the nuclear power plant. There is Sandy Koufax. He was on the Mr. Ed show. I'm not sure who he's signing that autograph for, Mr. Ed or Wilbur uh, Allen Post, but he was on that show. Leo DeRocher was on the Munsters, the Dodger third base coach giving a contract to Herman Munster, who doesn't make the team because he's too big. He's seven foot six, weighs 540 pounds, and injures players in collisions on the field and they get rid of him. Uh, Jim Lefevre is on the right, Al Ferrara on the left, Dodger teammates. Ferrara said he knew he made the major leagues when he had one of these baseball cards. In the 1990s, I did a long interview with Ferrara when he was the man, rather uh, with uh, Lefevre, when he was the manager of the Seattle Mariners. And I said, what, what were you doing on Gilligan's Island? How come you didn't tell anybody they were castaways? And he said, no, oh, Al and I were supposed to uh, shrink Gilligan's head and then have him for lunch. Obviously, that didn't happen. But you can see the condiments out there, ketchup and mustard and all that other stuff. 
Oh, just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. Johnny Roseboro on Dragnet. Uh, the Dodgers owner in Los Angeles, Walter O'Malley, appeared with the Rifleman star and the one-time Brooklyn Dodger first baseman Chuck Connors in an episode of Branded on NBC in 1965. The Dodgers center fielder Willie Davis acted in The Love Machine. Jerry Lewis's Which Way to the Front and the uh, TV show The Flying Nun. Roseboro appeared in Dragnet 68. Burke's Law, Craft Suspense Theater, Mr. Ed, and Experiment in Terror. Now, if I was with you and I was doing this live and you were there and we were going back and forth with one another and Zoom doesn't allow you that capability necessarily, I would ask you who the guy on the left is and who the guy on the right is, but I will not ask that uh, because it takes a while to somebody uh, to type it in or whatever. The guy on the left is Phil Silvers. Uh, the star of the Phil Silver Show, or You'd Never Get Rich, or Sergeant Bilko on CBS in the 1950s. The guy on the right is Steve Bilko. He was a prolific home run hitter in the Pacific Coast League with Los Angeles. One of these guys, too good for the minor leagues, not good enough for the major leagues. He'd hang around the major leagues and be sent back down. Of course, there were only 16 teams in those days today with 30. He'd probably be in the major leagues and probably be one of these guys who hit 40 home runs a year and strike out about 200 times a year. But Steve Bilko, how did the Phil Silver's name and character come up and be Bilko? Well, that's simple. Nat Hyken, who is the guy who put together the uh, uh, Phil Silver show, and then Car 54, Where Are You?, uh, was watching Steve Bilko, said, that's it. That's the guy I want as the name of the character. Uh, Donna Reed, Brady Bunch, Mr. Ed, The Munsters, Phil Silver Show, and other shows you would find baseball players in the 60s going into the 70s. That is Moose Steubing, Moose Steubing, manager of the uh, Anaheim Angels in the 1980s. Also, uh, uh, Moose was from the Bronx, New York, born in 1932. Oh, and there is Captain Steubing, Captain Merrill Steubing. So how did Moose Steubing become Merrill Steubing? Well, that's simple. Uh, Aaron Spelling, the king of schlock. Who's the king of schlock? Uh, he had Charlie's Angels on. He had uh, the pain, the pain, the fantasy island. He had the love boat. Uh, he had dynasty. Uh, he had all these shows on. Um, and they were schlocky shows. And he admitted they were schlocky shows. But uh, he was um, a baseball fan. And one of the things that he did was get the baseball encyclopedia and look for names that could be the name of TV characters. And he names Captain Merrill Steubing of the Love Boat after seeing Moose Steubing's name in the baseball encyclopedia. Speaking of spelling, uh, John Forsythe was uh, his first paying job as an actor or a performer was as the public address announcer for the Brooklyn Dodgers at Ebbets Field in the 1950s. And he would, of course, be one of the stars of one of Spelling's biggest hits, Dynasty, in 1980, in the 80s. And there he is, coming full circle from being the Dodgers PA announcer in Brooklyn at Ebbets Field to playing in the charity game uh, with his Dodger uniform on, raising money. And to his uh, right is Jack Lemon. Now, I talked about Mathel. Got to talk about Lemon because they were a great comedic team in the movies. In 1968, you might remember The Odd Couple came out. And Lemon, of course, is uh, Felix Unger, portrait specialty, and uh, Oscar is a sports writer. And you basically, if you're familiar with The Odd Couple, you know there's friction all the time between Oscar and Felix. But the question is, can two divorced men uh, live together? Um, and they did. For some, for some reason. But uh, uh, it's Shea Stadium. It's filming of uh, a scene at Shea Stadium. Uh, and it's the Pittsburgh Pirates and the New York Mets. And Bill Mazeroski hits into a triple play. That's the scene. Um, Felix calls Oscar as Mazeroski approaches the batter's box. And they said, Oscar Madison telephone. And I can tell you where the telephone was. The telephone was in the press level next to the official scorer's booth. And you had a tough time really seeing the field there. And because of the crowd noise, you usually turned around so you could hear who was on the phone so you're facing the wall, which is the exact scene you see uh, in The Odd Couple. And uh, Felix, Jack Lemon calls Oscar, Walter Matthau. Uh, what do you want for dinner tonight? Meanwhile, Mazeroski grounds into a triple play, and uh, Oscar says, hold on, what happened? They tell him about the triple play, and 
it's Felix and Oscar. Roberto Clemente was the guy that um, the producers wanted to ground into the triple play, but uh, Clemente flat out refused. Mazeroski did, made a couple bucks uh, on the way and was in the movie. Bob Euchre, I've known Euchre for about 40 years. Uh, here he is with Johnny Carson. And um, as you know, um, if you're a comic, which Euchre was, you're invited to the couch, you've got it made. Euchre was a mediocre catcher with the Milwaukee Braves, the Atlanta Braves, the Philadelphia Phillies, and the St. Louis Cardinals. And his career wrapped up and he uh, worked in community relations for the Braves. And also he was working on the stand-up comedy routine. In comes one night Al Hurt, the trumpet player, and he sees Euchre's act. He calls Carson and says, you got to see this guy. You got to see this guy. He's the funniest guy going. He needs to be booked on the show. Uh, he's on the show. He kills. Carson invites him over to the couch. They talk. Euchre's uh, comic career is made, and he's also the Milwaukee Brewers, and by 1970 or 71, the Milwaukee Brewers announcer. Uh, Carson didn't know who Euchre was. He was an obscure my, uh, major league catcher, but he was in the major leagues for about five, six years. And uh, Johnny leans over and says, is it true that um, you were uh, a baseball player? And Euchre says, I was on one of these, a baseball card. So I must have been. On Broadway, whatever Lola wants, Lola gets. Damn Yankees. Done in the 1950s. Yankees winning every year. Washington, first in war, first in peace, last in the American League. Although that was not true because they did win a pennant in 1933 and, and they were really good in the 1920s. Uh, but Joe Hardy sells his soul to the devil so the Washington Senators can win. Um, the other big song from that play was You Gotta Have Heart. And there's Ed Sullivan, who must have been so happy to get the New York Mets on the risers there, singing You've Gotta Have Heart, the 1969 world champion New York Mets. And uh, you might have you heard of my cousin. My cousin is uh, Jerry Stiller, passed away a couple of years ago. Jerry and Ann and Mira, and uh, Jerry told me a lot of stuff about uh, Ed, which I do in the early days of TV talk, uh, but one thing that Ed used to do is that, you know, see his watch to make sure the acts are running on time and all that other stuff. Um, so this is a good segue from Ed Sullivan to my cousin, Jerry, who has uh, my two kids with him there, to this, the Seinfeld Show. And George Steinbrenner. George Steinbrenner was on the Seinfeld show. Well, he wasn't. Uh, somebody played him. He almost was on the Seinfeld show. But somehow, George Seinfeld became friends with Larry David. And there are a couple, three scripts that uh, the Seinfeld people uh, got from George that I know of, as Marty Appel, the one-time Yankee PR guy, told me. He said, they got some really, really inside information on some of those shows. Three storylines I'm going to give you that were suggested by George. Missing George Costanza. Missing George. Uh, George Costanza is missing. But it's based on a true story. Uh, George was, um, yeah, he, he owned American Ship uh, in Tampa, American Shipbuilding Company. And he knew all his employees there. He's pretty good to his employees there, not like Billy Martin and the others around the Yankees. Um, but anyway, uh, he has a guy who's working for him, and, the, and George is worried that he's hanging out with some shady characters, and he could get hurt one day. Uh, he hasn't, but George is of the belief, yeah, he, this guy's going to get hurt one day. And so it's Friday. George leaves the office early, and uh, this guy leaves the office. That's Monday morning. George comes in to the office about 5.30, 6 in the morning, and he sees this guy's car in the parking lot, and oh no, something finally did happen. I know something happened, and he goes in, the guy is not there, and George calls the uh, Tampa police, puts out an all-points bulletin for this guy who turns up a bit later in the day, who happened to just go away for the weekend, and his friend took him somewhere. That becomes a show, and the show you might remember if you're a Seinfeld fan is Missing George, where George Costanza goes missing, and George Steinbrenner thinks he's dead, and all this other stuff, and he goes to Frank Costanza, played by my cousin Jerry, Frank Costanza's house, and he says, we think George, Stein George Costanza is dead, and uh, my cousin Jerry, playing Frank Costanza, looks at George, he said, you, you, you traded Jay Buhner for Ken Phelps? which was the highlight of the show, at least for me. Uh, George is eventually found. 
Um, Jay Buhner had a pretty good career with Seattle. Ken Phelps washed out with the Yankees. If you knew George, I knew George. Your food was his food. And uh, Marty Appel told me about this one um, because he was working for the Yankees at the time. There's a board meeting at Yankee Stadium and somebody brings in food. George smells it. Where'd you get the food? And they got it near the Yankee Stadium at one of the restaurants near Yankee Stadium. The whole board meeting picks up. They go to the restaurant. Uh, George buys lunch and it resumes. They made a show out of that. Different uniforms. Uh, the New York Yankees uh, Tampa affiliate in the Florida State League. George decides let's have some polyester type uniforms. Let's see how they work. They don't, but uh, they have different uniforms and that too becomes a show. Uh, George did try out for the show. There he is in his turtleneck. It'd be 105 degrees in New York in July. He'd be sitting in his box and he'd have the turtleneck on. Have the turtleneck on. He'd dress like that, 105 degrees. I'd be dressed almost down to nothing because it's 105 degrees. And he, his box was next to where we sat as radio people at Yankee Stadium. So I got to see George in action quite a bit. Uh, but anyway, uh, so he goes out to Los Angeles, he films a scene, and it's terrible. It is absolutely terrible. You could go up to YouTube and you could see it. That's uh, him with Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Seinfeld was quoted about that scene that never took place in the show. He actually did a scene in the show. It was terrible. We couldn't use it. We cut him out. He wasn't funny. I don't remember exactly what went wrong with it, but it was quite an awkward situation. And for you Met fans out there, Keith Hernandez was on uh, the Jerry Seinfeld show. Um, Keith becomes buddies with Jerry in uh, one of the athletic clubs, and George is a member, and George gets jealous. Why is he jealous? Well, because Keith and Jerry are palling around too much, and it's ruining, ruining uh, George's friendship with Keith. Keith actually did not know who Seinfeld was. Uh, his agent, Scott Boris, called him up and he said, uh, how'd you like to be on Seinfeld? He said, what's that? Seinfeld was uh, a hit show by this point. Uh, Boris explained that uh, Keith would be flown out first class. He'd been in, up in a nice hotel for a week. He'd get $15,000. Keith said, oh, of course, I know Jerry Seinfeld. Where's the $15,000? He was ready to play himself on the show. And with that, they actually became friends. George actually hosted Saturday Night Live in the 1970s. Uh, and they did a skit with him where he played all nine positions, DH, manager, coach, general manager, owner. And you know what? That wasn't that far from the truth, uh, that skit, because if he could, he would have done all of that. And uh, you might remember him, Garrett Morris, who played Chico Lasquela, the baseball player. Baseball been very, very good to me. Wally Pipp. Now, I was going to get rid of this part of uh, the talk with Wally Pitt, but I was watching Jeopardy, the first uh, episode of Jeopardy this year. Alex Trebek was still on, and uh, that was in September, and um, yeah, Wally Pitt, the last time he played with the Yankees was 96 years ago. Who would care about Wally Pitt? Well, apparently the trivia heads uh, over at Jeopardy did care about it, and they got the answer correct, or the question correct. I remember as a kid, don't be Wally Pitt. There was a myth. He lost his job to Lou Gehrig on June 2nd, 1925 because of a headache, and he called in sick, and he never got his job back. Well, there's uh, some truth to that, but not that much. Uh, Pip was beaned a few days earlier, did have some headaches, but uh, Lou Gehrig was tearing up the minor leagues. Lou Gehrig at that point was about 23 years old, and uh, the Yankees decided he was the better first baseman, and they were right. So don't call in sick because someone else will do your job and they could do it better. Wally was the answer to a Jeopardy question, season 37, show one. Cigarettes and baseball went hand in hand. Here's Babe Ruth pitching old gold cigarettes. Uh, there is Babe, looks like he's sitting on old Sparky and Sing Sing up in Austin, New York with a blindfold on, but basically he's just taking the blindfold test and told uh, the people administering the test Hey, old gold's mildness and smoothness marked it right off the bat as the best not a cough in a car load. Chesterfield, the sponsor of the New York Giants, and I've seen pictures of the big Chesterfield scoreboard at the polo grounds. The baseball, baseball man cigarette, Bucky Harris, the uh, manager of the world champion Yankees, 1947, he smoked it. Bob Elliott, he was the MVP with the Boston Braves. Uh, in 1947, he smoked it. Teddy Ballgame smoked it. Ted Williams. Sam Usual looks like somebody knocked out a tooth to stick a cigarette in there. 
Jolt and Joe. Well, Jolt and Joe, I guarantee you, did not pay for that cigarette. Jolt and Joe, a scooter, Phil Rizzillo once said, short arms, long pockets, never paid for anything. And Yul Blackwell, who is a pitcher with the Cincinnati Reds. When you change to Chesterfield, the first thing you will notice is their mildness. That's because of the right combination. World's best tobacco, always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking, always by Chesterfield. I just did a New York Giants commercial. Uh, Joe Garagiola and I knew each other. Um, I knew him from passing, uh, passing by a lot of times when I saw Joe. And uh, he grew up uh, on Dago Hill in St. Louis with Yogi Berra. Dago Hill is what they called it. It's now called the Hill. Uh, it was where the Italian immigrants ended up uh, coming to the United States, and Yogi and Joe's parents were immigrants who came over in the 1920s. So they started knowing each other in 1927 as two-year-olds. And Garagiola was telling me uh, one day when Yogi steps in and he steps in it, and he's talking about business, and we'll leave it at that. Yoo-hoo, uh, the drink of champions, really chocolate, chocolate with water. I hated it. It was vile. But Yogi liked it. Uh, Mickey, maybe some Cuddy Stark was in there. Uh, Moose Gowron, one of the nicest people I've ever interviewed. Um, and I interviewed him on multi multiple occasions. Uh, really good guy. Great storyteller. He drank it. Ellie Howard drank it. Uh, 1955, New Jersey. Probably not far from Montclair, New Jersey. There is a country club, and Yogi is there. And the Oliveri family, who put together this formula for you, who uh, and they're having all kind of trouble getting it on the stand or getting it on the grocery in the grocery store distributed. Uh, so they, um, yeah, well, they see Yogi and they're a little, they have some trepidation, but they're going to ask him uh, to help them out if he could. So they give him uh, Yoohoo and they tell him to take a drink. And they're waiting and uh, they're getting a bit nervous. And uh, the Oliveris ask Yogi, what do you think? Yogi's on board becomes a member of the board of directors, makes a lot of money from Yoohoo. Uh, and he was a guy who was in the office, as Dave Kaplan, who ran the uh, museum, the Yogi Berra Museum, once told me, because it's in the book, that's probably uh, in the library. Uh, this is Yogi. One time I was in the office and the phone rang. When no one else was around, I always answer a ringing phone, so I did. The woman who was calling asked if Yoohoo was hyphenated. I said, no, ma'am, it's not even carbonated. Yo Yogi, Sold craft Italian dressing. For me, it's got everything. Sure makes swell salads. Oh, I had a car that had a battery back in 1973 that needed water a lot, twice, three times a year. Hey, I should have listened to Yogi. Get a Presto Light high-level battery. Only needs water three times a year. I add water only three times a year. Yogi selling Miller Lite. Yogi selling a bicycle for Christmas, the Shelby bike. Yogi was everywhere. He was on TV, The Bilko Show, What's My Line, uh, I've Got a Secret, uh, on baseball, selling stuff, and selling stuff in the 60s and the 70s, and the 80s and the 90s, and into the 21st century, the last commercial athlete. And there is his teammate, DiMaggio. Um, Yogi once told me he went out with Joe and Merrill, and I said, what did they talk about? He said, I don't remember. It must have been an enlightening conversation. Store club. Joe didn't pay for that drink. Joe didn't pay for that cigarette. Joe didn't pay for whatever Marilyn had. Uh, but he was married to Marilyn. They eloped January 14th, 1954. Uh, in October 1954, Marilyn Monroe filed for divorce, citing only mental cruelty. Um, over the years, uh, now most of those players are gone. In fact, they're almost all gone now. Uh, the guys I knew who knew DiMaggio. Um, said it was more than mental cruelty. And uh, I heard some stories. I'm going to leave it at that because it's hearsay. Uh, but um, there were stories floated around about Joe and Marilyn and why they split up. And this is really why they split up. Um, Joe was uh, on the lot uh, the day that uh, Seven year, year Itch was being filmed and the skirt scene where the skirt blows up because it's the New York City subway and there was a gust of air. Uh, that's Stanford, Connecticut, summer of 2017. 26 foot Marilyn, who goes around the country in non COVID years every summer and hangs out every summer in some sculpture place. Um, actually, this one, uh, the first congregational church, if you're a parishioner and you open the door, that's the first thing you saw are the uplifted skirt. And to Marilyn's left and my left, you're right on the screen, there was another church and you saw her 
profile sideways. Somebody had a sense of humor in Stanford. Uh, Joe DiMaggio, what he wanted from a wife was a stay-at-home wife who cooked him dinner every night, wasn't more famous than he was, didn't make more money than he did. Uh, that wasn't Marilyn. But you know what? She dies in 1962 from the su suicide. Joe wanted to remarry her, and there was plans to remarry around 1963. Never happened. The song, Mrs. Robinson, Mrs. Roosevelt, that's how that song started out. Paul Simon uh, started out looking for heroes for that song, which became Mrs. Robinson. Uh, there was a 37-second snatch of music uh, in The Graduate, Mike Nichols, who uh, was the guy who wrote The Graduate. And uh, he said to Paul Simon, you know, we should flush that song out. It could be a hit. He did. Uh, and when Paul brought it back to him, it became uh, Mrs. Robinson. Initially, it was Mrs. Roosevelt, as in Eleanor Roosevelt. We then start the fire. Has Joe in there, the Billy Joel song. Joe and Joe DiMaggio, Joe, Joe DiMaggio. That was from the 40s. Did you see Jackie hit that ball? Duke Ellington and Mickey. Therese Brewer singing the song about Mickey. But uh, let's talk about Mrs. Robinson, back with old friends and bookends. Paul Simon just recently sold his music catalog, uh, made a lot of money off of that, so he doesn't have to worry about leaving it to his kids and fighting over how much money I should get, you should get, because he could split it up prior to uh, his ultimate passing, which will be you know, a number of years down the road, hopefully, for him. Anyway, uh, some of the old Yankees told me that uh, Joe and Paul uh, had dinner together, which Paul, of course, paid for. And DiMaggio comes in, where have I gone? What do you mean, where have I gone? I'm here, I'm with you. I did a Mr. Bowery, uh, a Bowery commercial. I did a Mr. Coffee commercial. I'm around, I haven't gone anywhere. And Paul Simon goes intellect on him, which is a mistake. And he says, uh, because I dealt with Joe in the 80s and 90s, and uh, you never went intellectual with him. His brother, Dominic, you could go intellectual with, but not, not Joe at all. Anyway, uh, so he's trying to explain this, that he's looking for heroes, and he thought about Eleanor Roosevelt, he thought about Ted Williams, because he was in the Korean War, and he was in World War II, and then he finally settles on Joe. And he says, hey, Joe, you know, where'd you go? You were, I was 10 years old. You retired. I didn't see you again. Well, you know, what happened? You're not here. You're not here. So where'd you go? And eventually DiMaggio, okay, okay, pay for the bill. Good night. Have a good time. Uh, Paul Simon was on the Cabot Show. And uh, on the Cabot Show, he said, I didn't mean the lines literally. I thought of him as an American hero and that genuine American heroes were in short supply. He accepted the explanation, thanked me, and we shook hands and said goodnight. And then Dick Cavett brought up Mickey Mantle, who once said to Paul Simon, why'd you use him? Uh, why not me in that song? And uh, Paul said, Mickey Mantle does not sound as Joe DiMaggio, as good as Joe DiMaggio in a song. DiMaggio and Mantle hated one another. And Dick Cavett uh, knew about that, uh, which is why he brought it up. DiMaggio was a fading 37-year-old player in 1951. He looks to his left and he sees this 20-year-old, beautiful, blonde-haired guy, chiseled. His name is Mantle, out of the earth. He's jealous. Uh, it's the 1951 World Series against the uh, New York Giants. It's a fly ball hit to right center field. And Mickey, who had, uh, who had great speed, really great speed, is chugging along, ready to get the ball trips over a drain and tears up his knee. Uh, he thought Joe loafed on the ball. That's why he hated Joe. And uh, so uh, they hated one another because of that. Cavett knows the background of the story. He knows Mantle asked you know, Paul Simon, why him, not me? And Simon replies, it's about the syllables, Dick. It's about how many beats there are. That is uh, Terry Cashman. He and I share a periodontist in uh, Riverdale in New York. In fact, I'm seeing my periodontist Monday morning at eight o'clock. I got both my vaccines, so I feel safe now going to the periodontist, although he had it. Uh, anyway, he was baseball's balladeer in the 1980s. I got to know him a little bit in the 1980s. He wrote the song, Willie, Mickey, and the Duke talking baseball. And if you look at that picture, it looks empty, and it is empty. It's Duke, it's Willie, it's Mickey, and it's Claude Rains, the Invisible Man. The guy who's supposed to be in there walking in Shea Stadium uh, together as royalty, Joe DiMaggio. He's airbrushed out of there. He asked Terry about, um, why wasn't I in there? And Terry said it was about guys from the 1950s. You didn't belong. And Joe agreed with him. He didn't belong. 
Phil Rizzuto is the only Hall of Famer with a gold record, Paradise by the Dashboard Light by Meatloaf, who lived near me. Get to see Meatloaf every once in a while. And I once talked to Meatloaf about it. I said, why was Phil on that record, gold record? He said, we wanted Phil Rizzuto because we thought he was great. We loved him as an announcer with the Yankees. Um, so we get him in the studio and we say, just be Phil Rizzuto. Phil Rizzuto is not being Phil Rizzuto. He may think he's Olivier. Finally, they get him to be Phil Rizzuto. The song, um, the spoken part of the song is about a guy uh, who may not be in love with a girl, but he's in the back seat of the car and, you know, what's supposed to happen. Uh, and he gets to first base, he gets to second base, gets to third base, the suicide squeeze is on, he scores. Um, the woman is reluctant uh, to um, have this happen to her, and she would only do it if he promised her to love her forever and get married. Uh, Scooter's kids were going to university in uh, Boston in the late 1970s. They're my age, Scooter's kids, as a matter of fact. And, um, and they told him, hey, Dad, that song's about sex. That Huckleberry, he fooled me. That Huckleberry meatloaf, that's what he told me. Uh, but he kept the gold record, Phil Rizzuto. Never knew what it was about. Hey, the baseball cards. Uh, Topps Baseball Cards is going public as of today with the Mudrick Corporation. Uh, there's a merger between Topps Baseball Cards and Mudrick, and you too now can own a share of Topps Baseball Cards if you so want uh, as it's going public on uh, the uh, NASDAQ exchange. But the baseball card... Baseball card was a big deal for kids like me in the 1960s. It's not today. Baseball cards are not a big deal, except to kids like me who are 65 years old. I don't collect them anymore, but I know people who still do. Uh, the baseball card can teach you how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide if you wanted to know on the back of the baseball card how somebody was doing. Uh, it also was your entree to Atlantic City or up in Connecticut or wherever you choose to place your bets because you used to flip cards, right? Uh, flip them like that or flip them like that. Or, or you, were, you did business with these cards. You wanted somebody. You wanted somebody and you had to figure out who to trade to get to that card that you want. So you made business decisions as an eight-year-old. Also, geography says Oakland on this card. So if you want to look up where Oakland was, you got your atlas or you got your globe and you can find out where Oakland was on the map. And they made great bicycle flaps. You got that clothespin, uh, put the uh, clothespin uh, in the spokes. Uh, and put a baseball card in there, and they made that whirling sound, that cool whirling sound. Today, 2021, uh, there aren't really new songs about baseball, not really much new literature, which reminds me of a story of Yogi. Ernest Hemingway is around. He wrote Old Man in the Sea that featured DiMaggio back in 1938. So Hemingway's around, and uh, he's at, in the Yankee clubhouse, and he's meeting all the Yankees. Ernest Hemingway, Whitey Ford, Whitey Ford, Ernest Hemingway down the line, then he gets to Yogi. And uh, he's introduced, Ernest Hemingway, meet Yogi Berra, Yogi Berra, meet Ernest Hemingway. And Yogi sticks out his hand and says, hey, Ernie, what paper you write for? Kansas City Star, just another sport. Homer Simpson honored the Baseball Hall of Fame 2017, along with the poem, Casey at the Bat, and along with the song, John Fogarty's Center Field, which went in in 1985. League of Their Own, the movie, and of course, Abbott and Costello, who's on first. Baseball no longer resonates the way it did when I was a kid. It was just baseball. That was it. All the other sports trailed. It was baseball. But that guy, who I'm interviewing in 1988, Bruce Morton, is uh, there on my left. Occasionally, he comes to some of my talks where we talk. Um, you get a two for one occasionally. And I'm talking to Joe. It's the 20th anniversary of the Jets winning the uh, Super Bowl. And I'm talking to Joe in this picture in the Marinek in 1988 about the significance of the Jets winning the Super Bowl, which made the Super Bowl the quintessential sports event in the United States. World Series didn't rank there anymore. In 1950, it was baseball, horse racing, and boxing that dominated American sports. By 1965, football had surpassed baseball as the most popular spectator sport in the United States. He couldn't say boxing. That's Muhammad Ali and me in 1985. Um, he was bigger than boxing. He was one of the true giants of the world in the 1970s. 
Uh, but uh, he faded away in 1982, and boxing has faded away. That is Gulfstream. Um, that's a horse track down in Hellendale, Florida. Uh, horse racing has been saved by the uh, casinos, or as uh, Tim Rooney told me at uh, Yonkers Raceway, the, the machines with the bells and whistles, uh, the slot machines. That's Jim Bouton. 1970, he wrote the quintessential baseball book, Ball Four. Uh, which the New York Public Library in 1999 said was one of the 20 most influential books, nonfiction books of the 20th century. Um, here's Jim and I, that's also at the Yogi Berra Museum. Jim and I crossed paths quite a few times, uh, but never really hooked up on the same stage. And even here, we didn't hook up on the same stage. Uh, he uh, was speaking, and there was somebody supposed to be in between us. The guy never showed up, so they called me, Evan, get on there. Our other guy isn't there. And the only thing that day I got to talk to Jim about was Jim and I uh, took a picture together. How are you? Um, and, you know, here's my number and, uh, and all that. So that was in 2007. Uh, it humorized uh, ball four players. Um, and uh, Bowie Kuhn, the commissioner of baseball in 1970, told Bouton, renounce it, say it was all fake. It wasn't really real. Bouton refused to do so. Uh, the book was used as part of the arbitration when Peter Seitz ended the reserve clause which kept the baseball player contracted to a team in perpetuity unless that team decided to get rid of him by trade or release him. Uh, soccer has overtaken baseball and television ratings. Young kids like soccer. They don't like baseball these days. And it ain't over until it's over. You know, nobody goes to that restaurant anymore because it's too crowded or it gets, uh, it gets uh, late early out there, the uh, shadows in left field, or you better go to his funeral or he won't come to your funeral. Uh, tomorrow ain't what it used to be. The future ain't what it used to be. Um, so the big, the big one is it ain't over until it's over. Yogi's been quoted before the United States Supreme Court in arguments more than any other man in United States history. Uh, it's 1973, New York Mets, they're injured, they're mediocre, and um, they're not going anywhere. But, but, nor is Pittsburgh, nor is Chicago, nor is St. Louis, nor is Philadelphia, or, you know, or Montreal. They're all hanging together and anybody literally could win the National League East. But for the Mets, there was little margin of error. And Mike Dyer is with the Long Island Press, 1973. He lives down in Sarasota, Florida now. And uh, the Mets lose the game at Shea Stadium. So the writers congregate all around Yogi's desk. And uh, if you've ever been in a baseball clubhouse after uh, a team loses, you would think somebody died. Um, nobody talks. Everybody's miserable. And then they go out to the bar and have fun. And they're back to where they were. So you can hear a pin drop, and Mike asks the question, Yogi, is it over? Yogi says, it ain't over until it's over. The Mets would actually win the National League pennant that year, lose to Oakland in the World Series. Uh, and that's it. That's the whole story. It ain't over until it's over. For me, it was over with Yogi on uh, June 26, 2011. Last time I spoke at his museum, he fell sometime after that. And I uh, really didn't uh, correspond with Yogi over the last three years of his life. He was sick. Uh, with him there is uh, Brian Cashman, the general manager of the Yankees. I want to thank the library, the Glen Ridge Library, for inviting me. I hope you enjoyed my little uh, soiree down uh, memory lane. And if anybody has any questions or comments, feel free. The floor is yours. I just want to thank you, Evan. That was a lot of interesting trivia and facts about the world of baseball. That's and culture. And culture, exactly. Exactly. So you see it all in one place. It's amazing to see how much it's been referenced. Does anybody have anything to say about their experiences in baseball? I'm all ears. Okay, we got one in chat. Uh, what do you think of the new rule changes in baseball? <sighs> this will take about an hour or two. I'll make it real fast. I knew Howard Cosell. Um, and I'm still friendly with his grandsons, Justin and Colin. Colin uh, is the PA announcer for the New York Mets. 
And uh, his other grandson, who I'm friendly with, is uh, Jared Kahana, who is a lawyer for ESPN. And Howard, um, who passed away 25 years ago, 27 years ago now, I can't believe how long that was. But um, he's talking one day, he's talking about, it's hot to figure out a 19th century game in the 20th century. And he would say things like, you can't overanalyze a ground ball to Hopper the second base. Uh, Howard was basically saying, you got a game that came together in the 19th century and you got to modernize it. Uh, the traditionalists don't want the game modernized. And uh, I kind of look at it, well, what are you putting a runner on second base uh, to begin an inning in the extra innings? It's kind of silly to me because I never grew up with that. Uh, it's like the shootout in hockey. You, know, you decide a hockey game on, you know, a cheap trick, you know, basically a shootout. But um, games have to evolve. Uh, sports is entertainment. I'm 65. I'm not going to be around forever. But there may be an eight-year-old who likes the way the game is played with putting the runner out there and whatever else that they are coming up with these days. And you know what? The game that when I was introduced to the game in 1959, 1960, 61, it's not the same game. It evolved. There was no designated hitter back when I started watching it. So uh, baseball knows that um, in order to keep up with the times, you can't stay stagnant. You've got to change. Uh, me, I'm a tr more of a traditionalist, but I do understand that it is a business. And being that it's a business and you see soccer getting better ratings among teenagers than your sport, and you're looking in your sport, the average age who watches the games, about 61, and the NHL is about 50, and the NBA is about 47, and then you look at Major League Soccer, and they're in their 40s, and you're looking up, and the only thing that's ahead of you is golf. You have to make changes. You have to adapt, or you're not going to survive the way you want to survive. So that's what I think of the changes of baseball. They have to do it because they want to get young people involved. And, you know, the funny thing is it takes three hours or so to play a baseball game. It takes three hours to play a football game. But somehow it seems like there's more action in football. When in truth, there's more action than baseball. But in baseball, if you hit 300, that means you're failing seven out of every 10 times. So they're trying their best to figure out how do we reach a young generation? How do we reach inner city kids? They've been, they've been trying to reach inner city kids. The inner city kids see LeBron James. They see the football players. That's what they want. They see baseball players. Baseball's not cool. And they are trying to figure out how do we make baseball cool? And they haven't figured it out yet. One day they might, but they haven't figured it out yet. Anybody else? Going once, going twice, we're going to be going. Well, anyway, I want to thank everybody at the library. My name is Evan Wiener. Thank you for